Hello everyone, welcome to part 2 of this tutorial. In part 1, we covered the design process of this garment in Clo3D and in this part, we're gonna focus on exporting from Clo3D, creating a landscape and rendering in Blender. Let's get started. So, as you can see, I organized and renamed my fabrics just like this to keep everything clear when importing into Blender. The first thing to do is to arrange the UVs in the 2D pattern window. This is much easier than arranging them in the UV editor. The way to do it is by selecting all patterns assigned to a specific fabric and arranging them into a square or a rectangle. Since I have two opacity zero fabrics and two dress fabrics that share the same texture, I'm going to arrange each set together. That means all opacity zero patterns go into one rectangular shape and all dress fabric patterns go into another. One thing to keep in mind while arranging the patterns is that they shouldn't overlap and there should be a small distance between them. This is really important so make sure everything is spaced properly. At the same time, try to fit them into a square as efficiently as possible, minimizing empty space. Once that's done, go to the UV editor, right click and reset the UVs to match the 2D arrangement. Since we're setting this up in UDIM format, this setup ensures everything stays in the right place. That small circular rectangle shape in the UV layout is the button's UV. Just right click on it and fit it into the UV 0 to 1 space. This square is called a UV tile but in Blender it's often referred to as a UV island. So whenever I mention tile or island, they mean the same thing. Now select the dress patterns that were arranged separately from the opacity 0 patterns, right click and fit them into the 0 to 1 space. There's a problem here, some patterns are overlapping, which is exactly what we need to avoid. So while these patterns are still selected, move them to the second UV tile. Everything inside one tile can also be scaled uniformly to fit properly within the square. Next, it's time to arrange the opacity zero patterns. Do the same thing and move them into the third UV tile. Usually, opacity zero patterns get deleted during export, but I personally don't do that. I find it easier to just turn their opacity down to zero or delete them in Blender if needed. Before moving on, I just want to say that this is the method I use to export from Clo3D to Blender. If someone else does it differently, that's totally fine. There's no absolute right or wrong way to do it as long as the results look good. For exporting, I export the patterns, the buttons, and the avatar separately. First, go to File, Export, and select OBJ. Choose a path for the file and name it something like Patterns or Dress, then click on Save. In the Export window, uncheck Avatars and Graphics and Trims, check Thick and Unified UV Coordinates, and set the scale to Meter. Make sure your settings match mine, then click on OK. For the buttons, follow the same process. Go to File, Export, OBJ, name the file buttons, and save it. In the Export window, uncheck Avatar and Patterns, ensure Unified UV Coordinates is checked, then click on OK. Finally, export the avatar. Go to File, Export, OBJ, name the file something like Avatar, and in the Export window, only check Select Avatars, then click OK. Before moving to Blender, we need to bake the textures onto the UV maps so we can apply the right materials more easily in Blender. In the UV editor, click Bake Textures, select the size for the bake image, 4K or higher if your computer can handle it, then check All Tiles, Diffuse, and Normal. If you're using other maps like Opacity or Displacement Map, check those as well. Then hit Save, choose a path for the files and name them, and then again hit Save. In Blender, my workspace is set up with a 3D viewport, timeline, and shader editor, and my camera is ready to go. The resolution is set to 1080-1920, which is why the camera view is vertical. The render engine is Cycles running on GPU. If you have a graphics card, selecting CUDA or Optics in the preference helps with performance. Also, enabling the Emulate Numpad option makes navigation easier. I'll turn on my screencast so you can see the shortcuts I'm using in the corner. 
Now from the file menu, I import the OBJ files exported from Cloth3D. Holding down Ctrl key lets me select multiple files at once and bring them into the scene. Once they're in, I select the camera and move it closer to the character with G. Pressing numpad 0 switches to the camera view. Hold down Z and go to the render mode or material preview. To see the materials and shaders on the avatar and garments, switching to material preview mode is better than render mode, since render mode can slow things down. Selecting the dress object, I can see the fabric slots in the material panel. Just like in Cloth 3D, there are two slots named opacity 0. The alpha for both of these needs to be turned all the way down to make them transparent. For the other slots labeled dress, I enable the node wrangler as on. Then selecting the principal BSCF shader and pressing Ctrl plus Shift plus T opens a window to load the big textures from Cloth3D. Since my dress pattern is number 1002, I select both the diffuse and normal maps while holding Ctrl. Copying this material slot and pasting it onto the other dress slot make sure everything stays consistent. The normal map strength can be adjusted if needed. After that, switching to render mode and adjusting the light position helps make the character more visible. With Shift A, I add a hue saturation value node and drop it into the material setup. This lets me tweak the colors of the textures. After adjusting the values, I copy the node and paste it onto the other dress slot to keep everything matching. Now looking at the buttons, there's a problem. They look too gray. This is a bug that happens when exporting buttons from Cloth3D. To fix it, I go into edit mode by pressing tab, select the entire mesh with A and press Alt plus N. From there, choosing set from faces fixes the shading issue. For the button material, I increase the metallic value, reduce the roughness, and adjust the specular and anisotropic settings. Tweaking the anisotropic rotation changes how the light interacts with the surface, and this effect might look different once an HDRN map is added. The code value can also be increased for an extra polished look. Moving on to the avatar. If you're using a Cloth3D avatar, it will look like this after importing. The main issue is the hair. To fix it, go to the hair slot and connect the color output of the texture node to the alpha input of the principal BSDF. You can change the hair color by deleting the base color node and manually choosing a hair color. If you want more control, keeping the nodes connected and adding a mix color node in between them helps. Setting the blend mode to multiply and adjusting the factor and color values allows for better customization. One last thing for proper transparency is setting the light path transparency to 64. To create the ground, add a plane and scale it with S, then scale it along the y-axis to shape it better. From the preferences, enable allow online access and install the landscape extension. After adding a landscape from the shift plus menu, tweak the random seat mesh size and height values. Now select the landscape and move it down using G. Press Shift plus D then Y to duplicate it and move it along the Y axis. Adjust its scale and position slightly to create variation. Hold Shift, select both landscape objects and press Shift plus D again to duplicate them. Adjust the scale and location of these duplicates as well. Press 0 to switch to camera view and check how everything looks. If it doesn't look right, keep tweaking the placement and scale until you're happy with the composition. For this part, switch to render mode or material preview. Select the plane, create a new material in the shader editor, set the color to black, turn the roughness down to 0, increase the IOR, and set transmission to 1. 
Now select the landscape and rename its material to something like landscape. Set its color to grayish black and turn down the roughness to zero. To assign the same material to the other landscapes, you have two options. Select each landscape and choose the landscape material from the dropdown or select all the other landscapes, then select the one with the correct material last, press Ctrl plus L and choose Link Material to apply it to all of them at once. To add an HDRI map for the sky, open the shader editor and switch from object to board. Press shift plus A, add an environment texture. Click open and select the HDRI you want to use. I'm using one from Polyhaven, which has lots of free HDRIs. You can download 2K, 4K, or even 8K, depending on your computer's specs. Connect the environment texture to the background node. Select the HDRI node and press Ctrl plus T. Switch to render mode to preview the HDRI. Add a mix RGB node, set its blending mode to multiply and set the factor to 1. Add a black body node, change its temperature to 10,000 and connect it to socket B of the mix RGB node. Adjust the rotation of the HDRI in the mapping node until you're happy with the lighting and reflections. From color management, you can choose a view transform and look that you like and if you want, you can add a hue saturation value node to edit the HDRI. I also wanted to edit the landscapes a little more, so I made another copy of one of them and placed it somewhere else. Select the button, then the dress and lastly the avatar, then hit Ctrl plus P to parent the garment to the avatar. Select the avatar and move it to put it right on the landscape. Select the landscape, hit tab to go to the edit mode, hit O to enable proportional editing, select the vertices you want to move and press G to adjust them. You can scroll the mouse wheel to change the size of the proportional editing influence. After making some adjustments, check the landscape from the camera view and keep tweaking it if needed. Now, add a sphere, scale it down, and place it somewhere that looks good from the camera's perspective. Right-click and shade it smooth. Then create a new material for it. Switch to Object in the Shader Editor, increase the Metallic, turn down the Roughness, and increase the Specular IOR. Increase the Anisotropic value all the way to 1, then tweak the Anisotropic rotation until it looks good. You can also increase the Coat weight and Roughness a little bit. Make some duplicates of the sphere and spread them throughout the scene, making sure everything looks good from the camera view. For now, go ahead and delete the light, we'll add it back later. You can adjust your final render resolution from here. Just make sure your scene looks good from that perspective. Another thing you can do is to tweak the camera's focal length. A lower focal length gives you a wider, flatter view, which works well for landscapes. 
On the other hand, studio photography usually uses a higher focal length for a more compressed look. Select your avatar and scale it up with S to make it look bigger compared to the landscape. Since we're adjusting the camera's location, we also need to scale up or scale down some of other elements in our scene, so make sure to do that. I'm going to refine my scene a bit off camera, maybe duplicate or remove some elements, then I'll show you the final result. Now add an aerial light, place it where it looks good and increase its power. You can check its effect by hiding and unhiding it in the outliner. I played around with the light's angle and its location until I liked the way it looked. Select the area light and enable use notes from the shader editor. Then add a black body with a temperature of 10,000 and connect it to the color socket. I ended up disconnecting it because I didn't like the result, but sometimes it creates a nice lighting effect. Duplicate the area light and place it behind the avatar to create some highlights on the outline of the body. To keep the scene organized, create a new collection, rename it to Pearls and drag all the spheres into it. Add another collection, rename it to Landscapes and move all landscapes objects there. The landscape creation is done. Before rendering, make sure to adjust your render samples and if you're working with reflective materials, it's usually better to increase the samples. But you can also test lower values like 100 to see how they look in the final render. Also, make sure to increase the light path diffuse and glossy values and double check that light path transparency is set to 64. If needed, tweak the color management and view transform settings again for the best look. Once everything is set, hit Ctrl plus F12 for the final render. And don't forget to save your image once the rendering is complete. Thank you for watching. I hope this tutorial was helpful. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments and be sure to check out my YouTube channel for more tutorials.